Um, and hello, I am Neil Romanik. Welcome to the Flint Forum. Uh, this is our third Flint Forum. This one is called uh, Getting Out of the Lab, How to Measure Streaming's Energy Footprint in the Real World. Um, and uh, uh, I'm the editorial director at the Flint, but before I was at the Flint, I was at another publication that covered streaming and broadcast and especially technology around that. And uh, I met for the first time an organization called Greening of Streaming when I was there. Uh, and they had uh, just started. And, uh, the magazine I had been working on at that time had just started. And we we're looking at this very exciting space of sustainability and streaming. There was a lot of talk about it. There was a few articles written about it. And everybody was kind of talking about, well, how sustainable is streaming? All this video delivery that we're doing is, you know, is it, is it green? Um, and a lot of those articles didn't really get too far beyond the fact that it was like, well, it's not that green. It's not as green as it could be. But there weren't really any good numbers. Um, and there were a lot of assumptions, uh, a lot of guesses about, well, you know, we know the cloud is probably better than, you know, doing stuff on prem, right? Maybe, probably. Um, there were a lot of things about, well, you know, if we do things in this way, this is probably better. We do things, it's probably better, but no hard numbers. Um, and Greening of Streaming came along and said, we're going to try to get some real numbers on this. Um, and in digging, in digging, they started to come up with some uh, some surprises uh, and things that people had taken for granted um, turned out to not be true or at least uh, at least be questionable. So today we're going to have Greening of Streaming with us to talk about their bigger picture of uh, trying to measure and put numbers on the energy consumption of this whole giant infrastructure, very complicated infrastructure we're using to deliver video around the world. Um, and also very specifically how to measure or the process of trying to measure power in home devices. So the device you're looking at right now, for example, or the device my daughter is having to use now that her, uh, her laptop charger is broken. She's, I think she's using her phone in there now. Um, we don't know as much about these devices as we think we do. Um, and Greening of Streaming is trying to solve that. So uh, I'd like to introduce um, our guests. Uh, we have uh, Dom Robinson, who is the founder of Greening of Streaming, Ben Schwartz uh, of Innovative Consulting uh, and a Greening of Streaming uh, volunteer, um, and uh, Simon Jones, uh, independent technologist, also a uh, Greening of Streaming volunteer secretariat. Um, both Ben and Simon had working groups um, at Greening of Streaming, and they're going to tell us uh, about the work that's been done recently uh, and about a lot of this really cool work coming up potentially in the next year where we're getting closer and closer to this goal of measuring this giant leviathan of uh, streaming video energy consumption. So, <laughs> guys, thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, and this is going to be, I'm, I'm really, really looking forward to this because it is a huge project that Greening of Streaming is undertaking. Um, and it's also all about the details. So maybe do you want to start, uh, maybe Dom, can you kick off by just telling us about the bigger Greening of Streaming project? So, you know, this, this elephant that you've decided to try to eat. Um, uh, <laughs> And and then we can get into kind of the specific device measurement that you're uh, you've been dealing with recently. Cool, perfect, excellent. Ben's read my mind, and it, just to bring some slides up, that's excellent. Uh, you don't want to look at my face all the time. So, Green Extreme is about three years old now. Uh, we are an industry group that f focuses specifically on sustainability with regard to streaming as a, a as an application in its broadest sense. Um, we, uh, when we started, there wasn't really uh, uh, any focused conversation for our industry sector. And now, thanks to you know the Flint and many others, there's the, the conversations sort of really taken taken hold in the, in the industry. But uh, at the time, there was literally no conversation about it. Some of the questions I was asking at conferences were seemingly some of the first times some of the sort of architects of the big distribution networks had really ever thought about sustainability. It was only only four or five short years ago that that was the case. So we really formed to raise the issue, to raise awareness and to promote better education and engineering. We're not an accreditation body. We're not um, a, a standards organization. We work with such organizations 
uh, but we are uh, fundamentally a forum where where um, industry engineers can get together to discuss and to really try uh, sometimes some quite maverick seeming ideas and so on. Um, the uh, organisation is not for profit. Um, I, I run things day to day at the moment, although by and large Ben is my right hand man and is, uh, is, is much more than just volunteer secretariat and there's no just in our volunteers either because Simon uh, seems to spend more time um, w w working with us than most full timers that I used to work with in other contexts so um, it's a, the, the, there's a very committed crew uh, who are supporting uh, the core of greening and streaming and our members then form a handful of working groups I think we've got a working group slide Ben um, yeah there we go so we've got nine nine working groups um, I draw attention particularly to four, six, and eight. They're pillar, what we call pillar working groups. They really stand for the encoding, distribution, and decoding stages. I just said that in the wrong order, actually. The distribution, encoding, and decoding stages uh, of a classic streaming workflow. Uh, and uh, uh, while the other working groups are really important in, in, in broader scopes of work, these are the touch points, particularly with streaming, uh, the specifics of engineering uh, streaming better. Um, we've also then got a handful of less accord projects. So these are low energy sustainable streaming accord projects. And they're really making sure that we don't end up in an ivory tower. There are a bunch of projects which are formed from reaching out to, I think, 27 conferences with a lot of help from you guys last year. Um, and uh, we've asked the engineers to come out for their fiefdoms, out of their management silos and just quietly tell us anonymously if they need to what they think is the lowest hanging fruit and the most accessible uh, engineering that we can take on to um, improve uh, the sustainability of streaming. Uh, I won't go into the details of those now because uh, it would be a distraction. What we want to do is focus today on some stuff that we've been doing in particular in Working Group 8, uh, which if we go back to the Working Groups a second, Ben, go back one slide. So Working Group 8 you'll see is our consumer premises equipment, which Ben leads. Um, just to set a bit of context, Working Group 4 did an enormous amount of work uh, in the first 18 months of Greening and Streaming's existence to try to understand if an assertion that carbon uh, could be linearly correlated to data traffic. And we pretty conclusively woke the industry up to the fact that that was the wrong uh, metric to be dominantly engineering against. And we're pretty proud of that. Although um, on reflection, as we ended the second year, we felt like all we'd really done was stop something. And what we really wanted to do was start something. Uh, and so uh, working group A um, and, and was forming, Ben was leading the way, looking at consumer premises equipment. And he and I have had many hours of debate about the uh, volumetrics that are discussed about how much energy is actually used in the CPE uh, in proportion to the overall ecosystem. Um, and those discussions got thick and fast after our, our European meeting last year and over the summer really working group eight precipitated um, and at that point i should stop because there might be questions about the formation of um uh, uh, of what we've done which was your question and i'm about to go into the whole spiel and we should really steer to ben when we come to talking about working group eight but that, let's stop there for a second I'm, you know that you asked for a bit of an introduction i, I probably know that's great off scattergun but hopefully that that helps no, that was really good. And I have a bunch of questions already now based on that, but sort of try to stay on task here. The um, So a part of that and what we're kind of focused on here today is this measuring of devices. Um, and I would think, or, or the first thing that comes to mind is you've got this whole giant infrastructure delivering video. And a lot of it's kind of still a mystery, still unnodding things. And then at the end of that, you've got devices, you've got your TVs and your your phones and your computers and your, you know, your iPads, whatever. Um, and those, it seems like those should be a really known quantity already. You've got manufacturers kind of churning them out. So there's numbers on the backs of them. You can, you know, they, they're pretty much all the same. You know, you one iPad of a certain model is a lot like another iPad of a certain model. It seems like that should be standardized and we should know a lot about that. But I gather from the, the very fact that we're talking here that not as much is known about energy consumption uh, of those products when they're when you're watching a video on them, as we me, would have thought. Me, and why is that? Let me, let me throw two, two quick. Hold on a sec, Ben. Let me throw two quick questions back at you now. How many product? How many uh, t TV streaming devices does your neighbour have? 
and if so uh, how many of them are streaming today so we we might know how much those thing those, those machines use when they're in a sh on a sh when they're tested in a lab and even expect to to use when they're on a shelf but we have absolutely no real idea of how many of them have got from the sh warehouse to you or to your neighbor and are plugged in and are turned on and how many of them are on standby unless they're used for half an hour a day or if they're completely powered off unless they're powered on full all day no. so we don't have any of that picture we just have a few benchmarking um data points at the moment from labs sorry ben mm. over to you i can i can take that further J just one initial point is uh when you talk or you read the the academic experts that work on energy of networks and devices and it's their whole life and they've built these incredibly powerful complex mathematical models and if you read any of their books and most of them i can't read because they're too complex the maths but i can at least read all the introductions they all say the same thing they say please industry give us some real data because we've built this model based off some lab data and we don't know so, so so the best experts in the world are saying help we need some real world data so that's one point mm -hmm. and then to talk to uh to talk to um uh dom's point what uh, there's there's at least half a dozen really critical parameters that change a device's energy consumption. Let's just look at one of them, one that was demonstrated by the Ultra HD forum at last IBC. So it's only a year old, and, and it's one of those kind of dark kind of moments. So you think, well, that's just so obvious. Why didn't I think of it? And any TV that's less than five years old uh, um, will have a, a light sensor in it and will adapt the, uh, the, the screen brightness. So whatever it says, as you rightly point, Neil, on the box, it may say so many watts, so many things. We can prove that it's a factor three between the lowest light and the highest light in the room. You take a modern TV and you watch it in medium. Con uh, we did this demonstration. Uh, at IBC, and it was 120 watts, that particular TV without content. You dim all the lights, you go down to 60 watts. You divide by half, and you shine a shine liner. I put sunlight on it, and it goes up to 180 watts. Nice, really clean numbers. Those are real numbers that were measured. And that's just that factor alone says any single TV will be using, uh, you know, there's a factor three. And we know that the TV even though Dom and I don't completely agree on this, but we know it's at least one of the most important for, um, energy consumers, if not the most important. We know that the physics of generating light, uh, nobody's yet invented any magic bullet, that consumes energy. And so when you have a large screen with lots of pixels and lots of light, that's a lot of your energy, therefore your carbon's gonna go. And, and just the simple light meter I mentioned, that's one factor and there's at least five others whether you're using Ethernet or Wi-Fi, that, you know, and I can do a whole load of lists. So, so the whole point of this is to say real world, and I love the title you put to this uh, session, Neil. This is measuring in the real world, because, uh, and if any in the audience can prove us wrong, we'd love that, but we believe this is the first instance of somebody trying to measure it in the real world, not in the lab, actually in people's homes, because whatever it says on the back of your box, on your TV, what you're actually consuming will be significantly different, depending on how on the parameters you put on your TV. So, and it, so if I am a conscientious parent, I should be telling my kids to watch their watch TV in the dark. <laughs> that, would, that would definitely When I was a kid, they were like, the turn on the light, it's bad for your eyes. And now it's like no, yeah. turn Don't that well, light off. Do, do you need do you need a light to light your TV set? You know, if you're watching the TV, I'm not sure you need a light. So save the energy. <laughs> Simon, what were you about to say? No, I, I, it's a major factor how you've got your TV set up. And I wouldn't say turn the lights off, but get a nice, comfortable viewing experience. You don't want it too bright. You don't want your eye to suddenly change from watching a bright screen to looking into a dark room. But yeah, if you bring it down, moderate the the room. You'll definitely save on on the modern TVs, older ones less so. So that's, I mean, the the positive thing is that's one more thing for a, an AV enthusiast to geek out about. And I've got to get yeah. the the sustainability right as well as the viewing experience. And you know, there are a few guys who are going to love that, but the rest of us. Um, so, so what then? What are you doing? How can we how can we measure? It seems like there's there's an issue of like the actual devices, right? What, what are the actual devices doing? And then what are the consumers doing? Um, and it seems like those are already two difficult problems to manage. So, so are you looking so at both do, sides of those? 
just to just to again set, set a bit of a scene in working group mm-hmm. four we looked in the data center environment and we looked in the telco and within reason those environments are reasonably easy to get data points from um, measure might be a bit of a strong word at the moment because there's a whole complexity about attribution and con- consequential measurement at, at a life cycle assessment and measurement and those two have become a bit conflated but that's a bit of a different story um, but in in the data center, there are what I would call telemetry means to go and fetch data from servers or from racks of kit and start to uh, start to generate a picture of what's going on based on how you're using the infrastructure. Um, and that was how we kind of did the working group four experiments and some of what Simon's doing in project one as well. But when it comes to anything out in the consumer home, um, well, the first thing that jumps to mind is privacy. You can't just go scanning everyone's systems to understand when their power systems are on or not, because you could profile their house to be empty or something like that. And that would be, uh, you know, a, 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 I think a serious privacy consideration to be able to just wildly do. Um, <clears throat> but uh, there are some old legacy protocols for set top boxes like TR69 uh, and things which can, do, to, to some extent, create uh, profiling of, of the remote end of, of some systems, but they're not very consistent. So once you get over out into the home, you're really into the wild in terms of how you start to measure energy. What was happening initially uh, for various different lab tests that, that we I think we've all been following in greening and streaming for you know, four or five years now, um, typically meters like this were being used and plugged in between devices and the clipboard and pen method was being used to sort of try, try to take take note of a correlation between the, the, the wattage or the voltage measured on, on the meter and the activity on the device. Um, obviously, that's not very scalable. So most of the data at the moment has been formed on those sort of pictures. That's how your benchmarking in your um, in your kit lab is done before you do your CE. Probably there's something a little bit more sophisticated than this, but essentially the same sort of le- level of tech. It's an isolated meter. And it doesn't tend to read into some sort of centralized uh, accessible repository where you can coalesce data from a number of different points. So that technology per se isn't out there. Um, ben, I don't want to steal your thunder. Do you want to talk a little bit about what we've set up? Oh, so um, let me uh, show you that slide again then. Um, so basically, um, what we set up, we, we call the project REM for Remote Energy Management. Um, and this is the, a diagram, very simplistic diagram that shows how it was set up um, uh, in our two hackathons that we ran in January and February. So basically, uh, you can see my thing. So, so there's a screen device. At the moment, they're just TVs, but uh, we have plans to do all any kind of screen device. Uh, we had a first series of tests. We didn't want to stress the system, so we're just using USB sticks. Um, and I'll show you some of the results to put various different uh, video streams through the screen devices. Then we have a consumer grade smart plug. It's very important that it's consumer grade because we're going to talk about scalability in a minute. Um, And the power supply just goes through that plug. So and that plug uh, goes through a cloud service and stores the energy measurement. Um, uh, And basically this part here is inside the testers home here where we're online, we're in the cloud. Um, and so we did a first series of tests with USB, with USB based content and a second series of tests actually doing some live streaming. Um, so that, so, so uh, and the power, the, the, the smart plug you're talking about is here. So that is the same diagram for, 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 for techies. Um, and uh, yeah, then I can show some results, but I don't know if we've got there yet for some results. Well, what, um, what were some of those results? I mean, what did you learn from from doing that? Also, maybe describe it. What was the actual hackathon like? I mean, what, it was just, just it wasn't just well, you was, in a in a, a room. There were other contributors yeah, there was as well, about, to it, right? Yeah, there was uh, the number of us ranged between a dozen and half a dozen during the the the, the five hours or whatever the first hackathon. People came and left. Um, some of us were there from the very beginning to the end. 
Um, we were in different parts of the world. Um, we had uh, multiple European uh, mainland people and uh, from Scandinavia, France, Germany, um, and several UK-based people. Uh, we didn't and have who, any... were, who were they? Were they they were technology companies or broadcast? Yeah, the, or, th this is an internal working group of Greening of mm -hmm. Streaming, so it was exclusively Greening of Streaming members. So uh, you'll find them up. You know, they were all people that belonged to one of these companies. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and that lasted, yeah, so we did that, uh, for, for a bunch of, a, a couple of hours. And then we did a second series, uh, with, with, uh, there were fewer of us just testing, going much further in the screen, in the, in the streaming testing. So this was the, t the diagram of hackathon one hackathon two was just this second test. We kind of dropped the USB sticks. The USB sticks were, were fail safe to make sure was to calibrate it, to make sure we weren't measuring the wrong things and stuff like that. Should we go yeah. Should we go into, into, into that USB sticks thing a, a little bit? So um, the um, we knew that we were going to be hitting a diverse number of TVs. Um, so and as we scale up our experiment, then we expect to hit more and, and I'm more. I'm sorry. And when, more just diverse. one quick question. So it was it was a TV, but does it matter what kind of TV you were using? Or you well, were no. Saying, this, hey, this, let's this, just this, grab this, a TV and well. So this was my point. We didn't know what our hackathon testers were going to turn up with and plug in. And so right. as we, so there were two streams actually going on in the morning. We knew that we'd have to do a little bit of work in the background with each of the hackathon members to make sure that they could access a live stream. And we are working towards all our tests being focused on live streaming uh, in, the, in this initial sort of uh, for the next 18 months. We're really not focusing on video on demand because it brings in an asynchronicity, which makes it very complicated to reconcile data. I'll take a breath in. Um, so um, so we, uh, we we very much wanted to uh, focus on live streaming, but we knew uh, as we turned all these TVs on, hitting all these different devices, the first thing that, that we, we knew is we were going to have trouble just hitting play. Uh, and hitting play in an unequivocally e e equal way so that nothing gets tricked. And we, you know, we, we, we've watched some other people who've done tests of this type of vein, but in labs, um, and they've made mistakes by not really understanding how the streaming technologies work. So players weren't necessarily playing the top stream, which might be HDR. They were playing lower streams in an adaptive bitrate ladder, which adds a, a lack of determinism to the experiment. So our experiments have been very, specifically playing single bit rate, specifically set up streams. Um, but we knew that TVs would generally not find it that easy to play. Uh, Simon's got a, a sort of home lab that's more extensive than most, most professional labs, but Simon managed to um, uh, work with us to, to uh, work, 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 work with me quite a bit to get streams working to various different, uh, you know, Roku's and LG's and Samsung TVs as we went along. Um, I don't know if you want to dig into Neil. I don't know if it's interesting to dig into the specifics of those challenges because they're quite they were quite interesting. Well, it is um, one of the things that I think always comes to mind in, in conversations like this is all the other. It's very hard to stay focused on one thing because as you start, you're talking about those, and I'm, I'm talking, I also start thinking about well, set top boxes, and you know, you're talking about the Roku's, and and then those um, those other devices that become essential for the viewing. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and kind of how do you how do you separate those from the TV? I guess maybe Simon, that's a, a question for you. Like how close do well, you I get think, to the device before it? Yeah, our first step was to start at the TV. There's there's some TVs that are fairly easy to use for this sort of testing that have got an internet browser. You just type in a URL, offer up the end user a couple of uh, streams to select, and it will play. They're great. Um, other ones that don't have that facility, then you have to find some other way of driving the signal into the TV. Uh, our first testing really was focusing at TVs, but you're absolutely right. If you start adding in other devices like Apple TV or Chromecasts or all the other set of devices, you've then got two devices that you need to measure. So our, our first tests really were primarily at TVs that we could drive directly. There were a few that we couldn't, which is where uh, Dom and a few others were using Roku devices. But yeah, the next phase of work will be to look at uh, the difference between consuming the stream completely on one TV or using, say, an Apple TV or a set-top box to do that. So you're going to have two levels of energy consumption, and it will definitely be more. Does it does it the device change like if I'm using Chromecast or, or anything, 
Yep. Does using that change the energy consumption of the TV? Or is or is, is the energy consumption of the TV going to be essentially the same if I stream into it with a URL or I, I'm using Chromecast uh, or streaming, we, you, we, my we, DVD player? What? No. Reading and streaming doesn't yet have any data on that. Um, some of the organizations we work with have started looking at it. So yeah. the only data I've seen is between 0 0.5 and 5% of a TV's power consumption can come from its processing. Those are the two extremes I've seen. So almost yeah. nothing to up to 5%. So I don't know if that kind of doesn't really answer your question completely, but it sheds some uh, light. You can think yeah, about but... it phys physicality because typically a Roku stick or a Chromecast is powered by a separate USB feed. And it, you know, if you plug that into the TV, that's added to the load on the TV's power. If you plug it into its own power yeah. supply, therein lies a sort of good physical example of the challenge of where you place those power drains to measure them. Um, that, that, so, that's so. it. But wait, as soon as you get to multiple devices, the basic background power, the generic processing will be happening, whatever the TV and whatever the other device is doing. If you then move to consumer stream, what you're doing is moving the decoding process from the TV to the other device. So it's going to be a, really a question of which has got the most efficient video decoder, whether it's software-based or hardware-based. Probably not a lot of differences hardware-based. If it's software-based, yes, that will probably use more energy. But then you're getting into maybe the, the energy from HDMI as a connection, probably pretty low. But the display, the, as Ben said, generating the light, creating the image will stay within the TV. And that's where I personally, I think, a lot of the power is. But if you go back to Ben's graph, you'll mm. see that for black, when you've got no image being generated, there's still quite a, a level of energy being consumed by the TV to actually show nothing. And then looking at those graphs in the USB stick, as you start to show different things, whether it's uh, white in SDR, white in HDR, you're asking the TV to do more, you're asking it to display more, and as a consequence, it uses more energy. So yeah, yeah having this graph. So you can maybe talk a bit more about this because it's, you know, I don't know, just you turn on the TV and it powers up. And the idea that the different types of content uh, or different images on the screen draw different yeah. amounts of energy isn't something that I would normally think of. But so if the TV... Point to, 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 to kick off is that that, that first block on, on the complete left is the, is the, the startup screen of the TV. Uh, and you can see that it consumes, you know, almost three times as much as a black screen does. So, yeah. so th there's a message there to TV makers: they could they could reduce the power consumption of that screen. That's the, that, that's the basic screen that uh, all the TVs powered up to, and that's that average. Um, yeah. I think so it'd be very interesting to understand how many people <laughs> sit on that screen, or whether they're actually just using that to find other content. And, and there's a huge difference between TVs. Or what, you know, does it include any live video? Is it a picture in picture? How bright is it? Is it all white? Is it a, white, a bright background or dark background? You know, that, that's probably a great area that the TV manufacturers could optimize if people spend a lot of time on that screen. Bro broadly, co broadly commenting, you could infer that dark mode at EPGs would use less energy than, than bright mode if there was such yeah. an option. Yeah. Yeah, that, remember, that leads. Sorry, no, go on, Simon. I think that leads on to one comment. Uh, uh, you know, Ben talked about bright mode and dark mode. One thing we specifically requested the users to do was not to make any changes to leave the TV in the settings that they normally have for normal viewing, and that's another piece of work that I think we will do in the future is to actually look at how adjusting the different settings on the TV adjusts the uh, energy consumed. Is it a vivid mode? Does that use more power? But for the tests that we did in these two hackathons, we said to the end users, just leave it as you have on your normal usage. Don't make any changes to the settings. So we get a view of what is typical home consumption. I think this goes back to one of the really early points in the conversation is the TV manufacturer will say it consumes up to this power, but you know exactly what is that setting? And then how do the end users change that over time? Do they turn it into bright mode? Do they put it into eco mode? You know, all of those are quite significant impacts on the total consumption. And, and these are averages over a dozen TVs. We do uh, publish much more detailed results 
for the actual TVs. And you can see there's a yeah. huge variability. So, so what you saw above is basically uh, the same data as here. Yeah. Uh, and here is the difference in the, in the TVs. Is there anything just looking at this, uh, looking at, at this plot, this graph, uh, yep. that we should be aware of or that is especially remarkable? Well, there's I, look, I look at all those peaks the, and valleys, the, but I'm not there's sure immediately a bunch of, Immediately, you can see a bunch of lines that are almost straight, uh, and especially this brown one, <laughs> which is very thing. And, and what that is telling you is that those devices didn't respond to the content much. So uh, there's, um, there's some very simple technological explanations for that um, based on, on, on the early generations of LCD backlight technology yeah. basically where uh, the backlight basically says oh this might need a backlight so i'll turn it on just in case and i'll turn it on everywhere just in case and you can see yeah. this is a kind of experimental this was a 2018 8k tv so a, a, you know a prototype kind of tv used the huge amount of power all the time whereas yeah. this, this red and this blue you can see that those are those are modern uh, oled technologies which are very responsive um yeah. and this this 2017 TV was also very responsive. These ones are much more recent. They're they're, yeah. they're 2022, 23 TVs. But I think it's worth actually looking in detail at some of the later figures that Ben has got in terms of when we go to a live stream. Because one of the benefits of live streaming is you're getting a much closer synchronization and alignment yeah. of the viewing and the consumption. And yeah. therefore, you can see that but there's different is... models. But I think yeah. coming out of this is that uh, the larger the screen, more energy. That's fairly intuitive. But also the different technology, LCDs seem to be way more static, and OLEDs way more dynamic. So, so sorry, so, sorry, Ben. Can I? Oh, are you going to talk about signal markers? Yeah, you are. Sorry, you, you just come on. Go for it, Ben. So, so, so this is the first graphing. So this is early day graphing. It's going to be improved. We'll be showing it at NAB for the first time in public. Uh, this is produced by Humans Not Robots, who is our, our data aggregator. Um, and this is real time data. These these plots plots show up in real time. And uh, I'm going to just show a few of them to point out a few facts. It's basically the same graph a few times. Um, and, and you can see those same TVs. We'll talk about what those steps mean in a minute. Uh, but what I wanted to point out here is you can see this very clear drop uh, in almost all the TVs that were responsive. You know, some TVs just don't respond to anything, so there's nothing you can do. But any TV that responds in any way, we put these black markers there. Uh, uh, and the reason we did that is because we're going to be running campaigns, we hope, with many, many hundreds, if not thousands of devices. And as you know, all across the world, and as you know, streaming tends to, to drift a bit. Nobody's completely in sync. Um, and so we'll put those markers. We'll let us know exactly where we are in the stream on each each device. And uh, the back end of Humans Not Robots will be able to resynchronize the data when it, when it shifts and when it's a few seconds out from one device to another. Yes, just going to chip in there. I just I, I want to emphasize the importance. This is the central focus of this hackathon was to, was correlate it was generating signal markers, being able to correlate them with something in the streaming. At this stage, we're not being too specific about what we're doing in the streaming. We're not being we're not trying to um, drill into the detail. We were simply trying to get the energy graph, and that's what I love about this. This is an energy graph. This isn't a video quality graph. This is an energy graph and it dips when you go black with the video. And that I think is a beautiful uh, link between the two technology sets, which we've been looking mm. for that, that, that connection between in order to start making sensible decisions about where we go with our technology strategy around so sustainability. So the fact that we can now indisputably affect energy with something that we're controlling in the settings of an encoder um, and we can represent that in real time graphs. We can now start to build test environments where we can say, let's test things. Ben, can I ask you to talk about the little steps in the middle of this graph? Or yeah, well, that, that means, yes, I think Simon, that, that, that was the Luma ramp. Simon, do you want to take, take yeah. over this? Um, if, if we want to talk about the, the actual image, do you have the later graph that actually pick image that shows the video? This one, yeah. Because what I wanted to do here was actually create 
a test sequence that started off with some real world captured images. So this is live video recordings of uh, boats and planes, and then some cute computer generated uh, images where you just go up through a static level of brightness from, you know, this, this is the marker from full white to black, and then go up incrementally uh, from zero to, to full. Um, if we look at this sec the section on the left-hand side, you've got the marker, you've got white and then black, so you've got the first marker there. You can see that the first TV at the top, the highest value TV in the two video segments, is very, very static. It, it doesn't change the power consumption much. Uh, it's independent of the video, whereas the next two graphs down, which actually happen to be different size OLEDs, you can actually see that there is a quite a detailed variation between energy consumption and video. You can actually see there's sort of two halves, a sort of fairly soft curves on the left half and a much more dynamic spiky curves on the right arm, and that relates to the video content. But if you then move on to the next section, you can see the the, the, the top one is uh, an LCD. It only really has one, two, three levels of backlight power for you know over 16 different levels of input, whereas the, the next two down are OLEDs. So they are really increasing very gently, very incremental with the power. That's really the difference between the technology. And the last part of the sequence, which is the, the right hand, was I thought, well, does the amount of the screen area that's being driven to white affect the energy consumption? And I think for, as you can see for the top one, for the LCD, no, it's basically saying, part of my screen is fully white. It doesn't matter how big of the screen is fully white. It's just using full energy consumption. Whereas the next two down are the OLEDs. Interestingly, for the first sort of halving, each step was halving the area that's white. It's fairly flat. And then it nicely and linearly decreases in energy. So the OLED is actually very closely relating the screen area, the amount of brightness that's being produced to power, Whereas the LCDs are, yeah, I need to turn the screen on somewhere and turns it on. There are other graphs that aren't clear here that there was another TV manufacturer that we were looking at where they were doing a much, much better control of backlight. So I think that's something that we'll get into the next phase is looking at how well uh, LCD TVs, different manufacturers, different models control the backlight, regional dimming so that the amount of power that the TV uses is really related to the image it's generating rather than saying, well, I've got some bright pixel here. And I think Ben's going to highlight a particular mm. instance here, Ben. The, I just want to, I'm sorry to interrupt you there, Ben, uh, but we're about 20 minutes to go. And if you do have any questions, please put them in the chat. Uh, and we do have a question from Brigitte from, um, uh, from NDR. Uh, and. I'll go ahead and read this question now, actually, um, and maybe that'll stir up some other conversation. Um, Brigitte, Brigitte says, I'm Brigitte from Germany, working for the NDR, part of the ARD, Public Broadcast Service. It is mm -hmm. obvious that um, it's extremely complicated to get all the data since it depends on so many parts. What are you going to do with all that data? Are you in contact with the manufacturers? Are you talking to broadcast stations or streaming platforms to adapt their data? So we can achieve green streaming. So I guess that's a question we can get into later on too. But what is you know what's all this for? Where's all this going, and and how do we make it useful? So there's we we've always had a data plan uh, within greening and streaming. We we are um, uh, essentially we adopt, we adhere to what we call an MIT principle, an MIT license principle internally. So any. Uh, any little bits of software we've developed to, to develop readings and so on. We're technically open sourcing amongst ourselves and in due course we'll let that drift out into the public. I'm sure it is technically open source. Um, so the data, the principle of our data gathering is one, we want to see energy uh, impacts as we conduct various experiments and look at various different uh, ways that the 
if you like, the steering wheels that we can hold on our streaming systems when we make adjustments, what effects do they have? And that's the experimental evidence that we hope to get back. That data set, first and foremost, is being uh, made available to our working group nine, which is our academic liaison working group. So there are lots of excellent um, climate and uh, in digital media and, and sustainability scientists out in the world that we've, we've become acquainted with over the years. We don't talk about carbon in greening and streaming. We don't feel qualified to. We talk about energy because we can control it through software and we can look at infrastructure and so on. But understanding those, how those uh, decisions and how adjustments to that energy actually have effects on whether they're good or whether they're all happening in the wrong energy mix or whatever it may be, um, we are hoping that we can take our data sets to the established climate science community and ask them to hold up a mirror to us and use our real industry data to tell us where we are uh, in terms of uh, it, it, our impacts and so on. It's about pushing the right job to the right people. We don't ask climate scientists to engineer streaming networks, and I think reciprocally streaming engineers should probably be cautious about engineering sustainability strategies. We need to collaborate with people with those right skills. So our data is going towards the academics. Um, if you have a, a particular interest in that data, then reach out to us. I'm sure we can create some access. There isn't huge amounts of it yet. The hackathons have been small. We are proofing the um, proofing the system that, you know, we've got three or four more hackathons to go through before we're ready to launch an at scale experiment. We, we've got the next stage, for example, we'll be measuring the encoding end. And then we've got a third stage where we'll be looking, looking at the, the CDN, the packaging edge and the, and the, and the distribution cache uh, and the energy impacts there. And then we'll be bringing that all together and doing a, a sort of fifth set of tests to check that we can generate load, that we can see the signal markers we expect in the various tests. Then we will go through a round of getting lots of these devices out to a, a, a test community, and that will be dictated by who we're partnering with, where our members want to go, and what grants are available, because these are very often research grant uh, sort of uh, applicable uh, uh, projects. So if you particularly want to measure your audience, then do reach out to us. We're looking for that type of member. Um, the great thing is these smart bugs are really cheap and there are people spending millions of pounds trying to understand their sustainability strategy. But for a few thousand pounds, we can go out and get some real world data and stop the hypothesis and start to actually get some actionable information that we can engineer against. So, so yes, manufacturers may want to may want to pick up on this information. And uh, this is operational information. So it's how their pieces of kit all fit together that we're looking at, rather than any one particular discrete vendor's technology stack. So there's a, um, I mean, you know, you're talking about that, uh, that idea of, you know, the climate, you versus the climate scientists, or not versus the climate scientists, but you're definitely driving in different lanes. But there is that sort of sense of, well, not sense of there is urgency in getting a lot of this stuff up and running so um you know i can imagine climate scientists banging your door going what are the practical things that i can tell people to do next week um to lower energy consumption or you know and i and <clears throat> presumably hopefully lower carbon emissions uh, but you know lower energy consumption at least while we're trying to figure it out and i know that's something that you're uh, this is a very involved, very um, thorough process you're undertaking. And what is that like with that sort of pull between there's urgency, I want practical tips now about what I should be telling my kids when they watch TV. So we, Turn we the lights off, strong, whatever it is. So we, well, the, the cardinal rule of, of green stream is no greenwashing. So we have a strong um, sense of biting our lip about things. You know, we, we are, we need to do it right. And if doing it right takes too long, then, well, it's too late already. Um, but we need to do it right. And, uh, and, and, and we've seen the industry go off down cul-de-sacs already. You know, the, I think the, the, I, I would say that we, we prevented the industry going down a reduced data. You call yourselves greener cul-de-sac because the industry was definitely going that way. And it was going to be quite innocently and with noble intent, greenwashing the industry to sort of carry on down that path. So understanding that energy is used uh, much more by the provisioning of infrastructure and then leaving it on, over-provisioning it. Uh, you know, this is where the great debate between Ben and I stands. But Ben is right that in the moment of a stream, all the energy is being used by the display. Some of it's being used by the millions of set-top boxes and so on. A little bit less maybe being used by the more efficient and optimized routers to the core. 
But the big difference is all those set-top boxes are only on for very short periods of time relative to the infrastructure. So the integrate of those big, heavy GT shared infrastructures actually consumes an enormous amount of energy. Now, I, I think um, BT and the, and the London Metro uh, rail networks use the same amount of energy. BT UK and, uh, and the, the London Metro area networks use similar amounts of energy, just to give a sense of proportion. This is not trivial amounts of energy. Um, so we, I think it's really important that we, you know, we, we, we take our time and get this right. I, I agree with the pressure we're not dawdling. Um, if we could, we'd wave a magic wand and give ourselves a billion dollar grant and get this all done tomorrow. But we don't happen to have that. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to receive one if anyone in the audience has got one. <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah. Um, so, Ben, I think you were about to get on to another point when I derailed this. Or were you? Oh, uh, well, uh... Sorry. Um. <laughs> or, or not. I have lots of questions. If not, um, I just didn't want to interrupt if you were, uh, if you were. Oh, go ahead. Getting into stuff. Um, so I was wondering about, okay, there's the, the greening of streaming uh, is, the, you know, it's a collection of companies, a collection of individuals, uh, data experts, a bunch of people working together. But if, um, I guess, how are you interacting with organizations outside greening of streaming? And um, how are you, uh, I guess, you know, preparing the wider industry for what you're doing. I know that you're what you are working with some universities, right? Yep. So we, um, I'm going to jump in there. Then we, so we got working group nine has got our academic liaison. Um, we are, uh, we are actually starting up a project for at last. That group has been there in name for a long time, and we've spoken to a lot of academics. Um, we haven't had any data to give them, so there hasn't been a lot to do. But now we're starting to get the data platform actually proofed and running um there is actually a whole discussion to have about where the interface is between us and academia and we've got some great ideas that we're uh, mark and i are organizing a bit of a brainstorming session to see if the query language that we're proposing that they learn as a way to query our data set is a good handover point because those things can be a bit woolly um outside of that well actually with you know your, your colleague at the flint mill and others have helped us reach out to a uh, hundred, well, not hundreds, but many tens of tra industry associations and peer organisations and so on who are all thinking about strategy. And I like to think that we've been a little bit of a virus getting under their skin and getting connected mm. and creating a bit of an undercurrent of cross-talk amongst engineers and, 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 and providing a forum um, for that. So that ranges from SIMT and uh, DPP and uh, IABM and all the other organisations that you, you typically think of. We've actually been given quite a lot of support historically by IBC, so big shout out to those folks because they uh, they have been uh, very good at giving us some space to meet and things at their their events. Um, but they're, they're, it would be remiss to say that they're the only ones. There's been a lot of organisations that have helped us. And then in terms of um, manufacturers and so on, honestly, memberships memberships slower than it was a year ago. Um, you mm -hmm. know, this is a, a, I think Ben's written a great piece about hype cycle, and I think there is a moment of collecting our thoughts. We all went, let's save the planet, and then stopped and went, ow. And I think we're kind mm. of in that in that I think stage. So we're back to baby steps, and but coming out with some, I think, much more robust discussions than we were a couple of years ago, with most people starting to get onto the similar page, which I think is is great. Um, so organisations, I think, are waiting. Corporate organisations, businesses are waiting a little bit. Um, they they uh, they are busy finishing a round of assessing what they've been doing through existing data but i don't think many organizations are going out as engineers with a budget to go let's actually measure what we're really doing i think they're still far too much based on hypotheticals so, so but this also has that is particular with the, the the display measurement uh i mean it has implications far far outside media and entertainment obviously um because everybody uses this green for everything all the time um, so have you also looked at or talked to other organizations or companies kind of outside the industry? I mean, there's AV, I guess, which is slightly outside, but, um, you know, just device manufacturers or. So we've had some really good engagement with, um, uh, what are they called CT wave and CES, uh, so consumer electronics groups and so on. And yeah, they're very interested in collaborating. They, they obviously do the sort of benchmarking data that you've spoken about and collect a lot of that, but I think it's been assigned and pointed out we really need to know not what it does on the bench but what it's being really used for in the real world and we need to know there's no point in looking at a sample of 10 10 year old 
10, 10 month old TVs. We need to be looking at what the consumer's doing. And if 80% of the consumers st have still got a CRT and a Pace set top box or a 9X set top box from before most of the people on this webcast were born, you know, then we need to know that that's the case and measure that energy. And that's just completely lacking. And yet, I think the only reason it's not being done is because there's an assumption that it's impossible, but in practice, it's actually really quite a straightforward thing to be doing. Um, it, it, so, so yeah. There's just a point I'd like to make to, for the audience to make sure that they, there's no confusion. We've talked about displays and we've gone elsewhere and we keep on falling back into displays. Um, two reasons for that. One, I, I run the, the, the CPE working group and we did a hackathon and that's where we are. So we're talking about that now because that's what we have to show. We had to start somewhere, guys. Uh, but for, for greening of streaming, what goes on in the network, what goes on at the head end is just as important. We, we just so happen to be talking about that now. Now, it may turn out that in 2025, because throughout 2024, we will be rolling out measurements of other parts of the value chain. We may be back we can we can have a meet here again in 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 march 2025 and we might be all about displays because then we might actually say well actually the worst part of the problem is the display so that's where we but we haven't got there yet so i just want to make sure there's no misunderstanding we're talking about displays because we started there because it's easier because we have access to them um and it's not that easy because we're also going to do it in the real world with thousands mm -hmm. so one last call out to anybody in the audience who might be able to help us one thing where we're a little bit stuck is we do, we we have data scientists that are good at all sorts of number crunching but there's one thing we haven't really got uh, a grasp on is is what kind of sample size we need to be representative because we're doing real world measurements um so we either we have we're going to have to end up with two choices uh, as we run throughout our campaigns in 2024 either each device that's measuring content will have to know lots of stuff about it say well that one had this kind of ambient light it was in this environment it used this kind of wi-fi and stuff like that which is quite heavy going uh, what we'd really like is to have a large enough sample size to sit, not care about it and just say we are, we are measuring something that's representative of a given market and we don't currently have the skill set to to build that model so um and i'm imagine there's people working in marketing departments of uh, of broadcasters or people like that who have kind of done this homework we can do it we will do it if, if nobody can help us we'll, we'll get there but if somebody could give us a, a head start We're I'm going to there. further that actually, Ben, and, and so we are quite openly reaching out. With, strangely, between all the people I've met across the industry, nobody can seem to find us a contact at Nielsen. Uh, and we would really like to talk to people who've done that scaled up panel based um, audience measurement because we've got to the point where we think we've got an energy measurement platform which can scale, can be used remotely. That's a techni technician's task, and we've, we, we feel like we've completed that. As Ben says, we're not audience measurement experts we're not um we're not so you know social scientists at that level so any input we can get and help into in terms of deciding who to send the sample units to uh will be great and then that will help us with our with our strategy as we get past all the build stage by the time we're hoping to be built by ibc uh and actually be able to do those measurements ad hoc um but what we what we'll need after that is 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 somebody to post the devices to so. Um, we are just about wrapped up here, but you have an opportunity for a quick question. If anybody wants to ask a question in the chat, this is your, no, it's not your last chance, but it's your last chance for the live part of the Flint Forum. And then when we're done, we can have a more casual talk later, but this is your chance to get your, uh, your question broadcast throughout the audience nothing okay um so um i guess that's it for us i mean this is i feel like we've just uh it's kind of done the tip of the iceberg if you'll pardon the metaphor um well there's going to also... be more iterations there's going to be some more iterations as we go okay. through and we'll keep you guys up to date with those and, and i'm, to come I'm also really interested in that the, this bigger picture with the devices being just a part of this you know it is like an iceberg you know it is this is this little iceberg head of the devices but there's all this other stuff here, which is part of the same thing that you're trying to get your arms around. Um, and I think that whole big moon launch uh, of uh, piece of analysis is is essential and is going to be really fascinating to to follow. And also when you get more and more results. So um, there's some contact information we put in the chat. 
people can also go to your page that you have at the Flint's because you are a Flint partner. So there's a, a page, uh, a partner page that Greeting of Streaming has where there's uh, articles that Ben has contributed. Um, so you can get a lot of great information there. Um, and thank you so much to our audience. And thank you, Dom, Simon, and Ben. Uh, and we'll see you all at the next Flint Forum. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.